Hey, this is Cortland Sutton. Hey, this is Tim Patrick. And you're listening to The Snap, Snap with Sydney Jones on Broncos Podcast Network. Yeah! What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back to the Broncos Podcast Network and YouTube for the latest episode of The Snap. I'm your host, Sydney Jones, and joining me on today's episode is NFL Network's Jamie Erdahl. Jamie is a host of NFL Network's Emmy Award-winning show, Good Morning Football. Jamie, such a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Thank you, Sydney. It's awesome to meet you and talk a little football in the offseason. Yeah, you too. And appreciate you taking the time in the middle of March Madness. Jamie, I know I said this to you before we started recording, but you've been crushing it on CBS the past week. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, all for the love of football, you know, for 365 plus, but there is a special place in my heart for March and basketball. And I had, I was so lucky. I was in Columbus for the first round. I saw Fairleigh Dickinson beat Purdue and Michigan right. State push their way all the way to Madison Square Garden. So I was really lucky just to be on site too. I think being in a live sporting event environment is always really fun and it's refreshing to get there. So it was really great. Thank you. For sure. It's been a crazy tournament so far. The Mad- yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think this will be the first year. I don't quite know the cutoff, but um, potentially the first year that the uh, uh, national champion would be outside like the top four seeds or something like that. So I think the likelihood is, is growing. For sure. Well, Jamie, as many of my listeners know here on the snap, you know, one of the main goals is to highlight women's impact in and around the NFL. So for this week's episode, really want to dive in and celebrate women's history month. So appreciate you joining me for this week to be the guest to celebrate that. So to start, Jamie, I mean, can you just tell me a little bit about your roles, both with NFL network and CBS sports and kind of what those entail? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm a sports broadcaster by trade. I was at CBS for eight football seasons. That's my like calendar clock, if you will, um, before I came to NFL Network. My first four at CBS were spent on the NFL sidelines. I worked with Greg Gumbel and Trent Green. And then my last four at CBS, I was on the SEC on CBS. So covering the best game in college football, arguably every uh, Saturday afternoon on CBS. And those were my eight years. And I learned so much football in those in those times in those games and the players and the coaches and just the X's and O's of the game and working with some of the best play by play analysts on a great network. But I thought there was more to be had. You know, sideline reporting is a really special and specific skill that promotes and helps every broadcast and shares information about teams that sometimes I know we are blessed with a lot of cameras, but sometimes you just can't <laughs> see it all. So um I really, really love being able to do that. But Good Morning Football had so quickly become a show that's known for fun and creative ways to look at the NFL year round and hosting as a woman in sports, I think is, is a vital skill. And it's, I I looked at it as, you know, once I know that I could have the skill of working 15 hours of live television every week, talking about the NFL, if I can hang in that environment, in that arena, no one can take that skill from me once I'm able to you know, get that under my belt. So it was a, it was hard to leave CBS and all of the wonderful positions that they put me in within the game of football. But I also don't think I ever would have been qualified enough to have this job at Good Morning Football now had CBS not been so good to me. So it feels like a really nice, like kind of connective tissue moment between the two networks. I know they still work together on some stuff, um, which is great. And it's allowed me the opportunity, you know, Nate Burleson to go from Good Morning Football to CBS. So there is a pathway there. Um, And so, but specifically as it, what I, as it pertains to what I do every day now, like it just felt like the right moment um, at, after 10 years in television, just to say like, I I really want to host and I want to make sure that I know that I can do this, you know, for myself. Absolutely. Yeah. I know you joined Good Morning Football back in uh, July of last year, 2022. Mm-hmm. So was, you know, your first NFL season on the show? It was amazing. It was yeah. um, an absolute like whirlwind, <laughs> whirlwind and like, yeah. an, it had like this avalanche effect to it that like it just kept growing and it wasn't stopping and there was no right. stopping it. And it was like, you better ride with it or you're going to get totally taken down by it. It was a couple of really interesting aspects to it that as I look back on it is just to be able to start on the same day with Jason McCourty, someone who had done very little to no television. And then as a crew, you know, we traveled to London and we traveled to Munich and we were in both of those places for really historic weeks of football for the league and for the network. And it was the Munich trip that Jason and I really kind of got to sit down because this was mid-November by then. And we, we, he looked at me and said, I've learned 
so much television from you. And I've never heard, it was such a compliment to me to hear that I, yeah. I had never, no one has ever said that to me. And I just come in, And then I said to him, like, I've learned so much football from you, just how you appreciate the guys that you played with, how you talk about the game and the players and how he has carried himself as a 13 year NFL vet. And so right. I, I look back at that day starting in on July 25th of last year together. And then the way Kyle and Peter have just welcomed us in and allowed us to really kind of become our own forms on good morning football. Yeah. And it's such a fun show, but I will say that the, uh, the breaks that the, that the off season brings are a welcomed kind of pause. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I mean, you guys kill it every single morning. We have it Thank on you. the office every single morning and it's always fun to hear you guys. Jamie, what was kind of, I guess, the biggest challenge moving from sideline to hosting, you know, a daily show, especially when, you know, on sideline, you're assigned one game every single week that you have to, you know, know the nitty and gritty about. And on the show, you have to know about every single game that happened on Sunday. You hit the nail on the head. It's, um, it's, I have an understanding of what, you know, it, it's the standard of the knowledge that I want to have for a single game or my preparedness for a single broadcast. And I knew what I wanted to know and how I wanted to go about that. There was no way I was going to be able to recreate that for this show because there's just not enough sheer time because of all the football that we had to know about. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like the avalanche effect that I just talked about for the whole season, you know, the week, the regular season week to week, it has a snowball effect too. So, you know, on Sundays we do our best to watch red zone, to watch as many games as we possibly can. Right. But you're you're also not going to be able to see every snap of every game. So you show up on Monday, you do the highlights, and we've all hopefully kind of watched different games for different reasons. All yeah. of a sudden, James McCourty is talking about something that he saw from the Browns games. Um, Schrager saying something about the Ravens, and then that thing that Schrager said on Monday, you're it stays in your brain, and all of a sudden you're like, you know what, I want to talk about that on Wednesday, and then you start digging into it and you do your own stuff, and that's how the show develops as the weeks go on. It's like you hear things, and that's why bringing your own thoughts and observations and questions about games and teams and players mm -hmm. is a really cool creative process on this show because something that you say or you heard on Monday, we bring it up again on Wednesday. There's room for it on Thursday. Right. And three hours in a day-to-day -day basis gives you a lot of wiggle room for to just unpack stuff. But then mm -hmm. all of a sudden Thursday comes and you're looking to the next week. And so when you break the week up like that, you realize, it's like, man, there's not that much time to get into all the stuff that you really want to get into. So Right. It, it, at first it was a challenge, but I also just had to shift my mindset of like, what does true preparation look like? Because it's not going to be the same as it was when I only had one game a week. Definitely. Yeah. We're kind of staying on the topic of some news this week. I know you've been on the March Madness assignment, but you know, the first wave of free agency has been a little crazy. So what have you thought just about the Broncos moves there? Well, first and foremost, you know, it, I thought it was going to be interesting what the Broncos were going to do, knowing that they didn't have a first round pick. So I think that in the off season changes the nature of any team's approach. Um, you know, getting uh, getting Sean Payton, it, it was an unbelievable accomplishment and one that was needed for the Broncos. But what they had to give up and what they knew they also needed not at the quarterback position, I think, has been very curious. You know, when you look at. The Broncos, I've read that they're looking at wide receivers, yet they're shopping Jerry Judy. That, to me, tells me that Sean Payton has arrived and said, I know what I need, and I might appreciate this player, but he's just not it, and what you might be able to get back from a former first-round pick and Jerry Judy. Um, you know, I think signing a, a backup quarterback that has experience and that, you know, is going to pace Russell Wilson in a way that I just, I really respect. And what everyone knows about Sean Payton is that he knows what he wants and what he's going to need to run a successful team. So at this point, anything the Broncos are doing, whether it be signing Samaji P Ryan or bringing back Zach Allen, like it's just, he, it's essentially like in Sean Payton, I trust because I'm like, until he shows that he can't do it, like the man can do no wrong. <laughs> I agree. I love it. In Sean Payton, we trust. I'm going to start saying that. Yeah, exactly. He'll, I'm sure he'll love it. He'll like, get in here. Let's talk about football. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, Jamie, you said it, you know, we kind of addressed a, a lot of needs here, you know, with offensive line, with the defensive line, you mentioned we yeah. brought a, a running back, a tight end. Since we don't have a first round or a second round pick in the draft, what do you expect this team to kind of target? What needs do you think they, they still need to look at as we head into you know the draft, which is only a month away? Well, the tricky thing about last year's team was you you looked at it and you're like, well, your defense was solid. You had veteran guys in the secondary. They were supposed to be good. And 
gosh, I can't quite, we were making this parallel on the show the other day that, you know, Russell Wilson, for as good as he is, like he didn't have to arrive in Denver and blow it out of the water last year because your defense was as good as they were. But then the offense, like they, they didn't have to be great, but they had to do more than they did. And there, there was like a happy medium in there that just did not exist. And so, you know, I think working together, the, the Sean Payne, Russell Wilson marriage, like it has to work. Like it, there, I don't think there is another option for your new ownership group to take on what they have done and to say, we have found the guys that are supposed to be working together and it is supposed to click. Now, what do you need? So what, like, whether that be a different wide receiver than a Jerry Judy, whether that be a certain pass catching running back or changing the way your offense looks, obviously the investment has been placed on the offensive side of the ball to figure out some things that just did not work in the first year for Russell Wilson. Right. But that's it. I mean, it's like, it was not the question mark we thought because the AFC West was supposed to be like this shiny penny last year. And like, I I was just, it was amazing in September watching Denver in like, not a good way. It it was like, (laughs) like fascinating and puzzling and no one could figure it out. And so I think figuring out the offensive identity and how it clicks and sparks, because it just felt like an engine that wasn't turning over last year. Right. Yeah. I know a lot of us are really excited to see what Sean Payton's offensive scheme will look like here and you know what he can do with this team. So yeah, we appreciate your thoughts on the team. I want to circle back to women's history month to end the episode here, you know, looking back to when you first got into the industry, you know, how would you, I guess, describe the progress that you've seen in regard to women representation in this industry? Well, I always think that not only is it important to see women in especially specifically in television on camera, I think for me working, I am one person who works on a production of for is if there's one of me, there's 20 people behind the camera who run the shows too. Yeah. And representation is important to see on camera for women, but also in production, in in the rooms where they're making the talent hires, where they're making the editorial decisions, mm-hmm. having awareness for what women want to say as female fans and football are growing by the masses every year. Um, it's important, you know, it used for a long time. It was great to have women on television. Now I think the next goal should be to have women in television. So it's not just a woman sitting at a desk with men being, being asked to say things from an editorial perspective Mm -hmm. on decisions that are made by men. I think having a room that has representation is vital just to make the conversations more more well-rounded and to understand that like, this isn't just, I'm not just a parrot sitting here and being like, we're asked to talk about this. Like, you know that the direction you're going in is also being made by a group of people where women are included. I absolutely love that. Couldn't be more right. Yeah. Jamie, you know, have you, have there been any challenges that you faced kind of in that regard throughout your journey in this industry? You know, when I was, I'm 34, when I was younger, um, when I first started my first TV job for my first few years, I worked in Boston. I, you know, I think it's hard for young women in a space where validation is in sports television oftentimes looks like coaches or athletes yeah. look, liking you. Like they, they need to like you as a human being to mm-hmm. share information with you, to come across on television or on the radio or in print you know, you're, you're not going to get anywhere in life by being not a nice person. Therefore the subjects aren't going to want to talk to you, whatever. So Mm -hmm. I think it is particularly hard as a woman in, in sports to amass relationships in a way that you feel no matter what your way that you go about it is that you feel comfortable with in a professional way and making sure that you are okay with how you are connecting with the athletes and also how they are connecting back with you. And I just remember realizing that everyone, every woman in in this industry is going to go about that a different way. There is no cookie cutter way to say like, this is how you make a friend. This is how you get a coach to like you. Mm -hmm. You have to do it your own way. You have to feel good about it every day. And um, I just remember struggling with that because, and every every job in sports media is different too. What writers need is very different than what a sideline reporter needs. So Mm -hmm. I realized that once I kind of got over the fact that my friendships or relationships with athletes is going to look very different compared to other women in the industry, I kind of, it gave me more freedom. Like, I'm just going to act like myself and I am going to, whether it's slower than somebody else or faster than somebody else, 
as long as I feel good about it in the end from a professional standpoint, and I know that I'm staying true to myself, then it's, then it's everything will work out fine. I'll feel good about it at the end. Yeah. Just do you. I love that. Yeah. Just do Yep. Something that really stuck out, which you said, Jamie, is just be a good person. I feel like a lot of the times when people ask about advice in this industry, that's one that, you know, sounds so simple, but really matters for sure. Yeah, I, I've said it. I've said it a lot in when I speak to college classes. When I was working on the SEC, I would pop into journalism classes. And yeah, I know it's I know it's a strange percentage that I'm sure maybe some of my TV bosses are like, please don't say that. But it's yeah. like and the number changes. But I like to say 65 percent of this job really has very little to do with what you're doing on camera, on television. Like you have, you have to be able to be somebody who, when Nick Saban is walking the field in Tuscaloosa, I understand that from a media contractual obligation, he has to come and talk to me, but you know, is he going to shake my hand? Is he going to make small talk about whatever the weather, the fact that I just had a baby, anything like that, or is he just going to have this air about him? That's like, let's get this over with because you're going to do the interview, but like, you know, it's you're either going to talk to somebody one time or a hundred times. And I think regardless, because that that person that you think that you might be talking to one time, it could turn into a hundred times. And you don't want to ever think of like, my gosh, I really should have done that differently. I shouldn't have said that. Or, you know, you want to be proud about how you're carrying yourself and interactions like that, no matter how high the person is on the, on the ladder or low. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that kind of leads me into my last question here. Just wanting to inspire, you know, the younger generation to end this episode. So, you know, Jamie, throughout all of your experiences in the industry, what is, you know, the biggest, biggest piece of advice that you would give someone looking to get into it? I think it's important, no matter what role you have in sports media, you know, you, uh, and and I know there are television jobs out there that is called the one man band. I get that. And I know that you're going to go out and some people are all going to run their own camera, whatever. Yeah. I no had- matter what, <laughs> right. No matter yeah, what. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And there, and, it, and it, to an extent, it is a one man band, but there are other people that will eventually put that stuff that you just produced and edited on the, on television. Like That's there are, right. you, yeah. you have to appreciate and know what the whole team is doing because yeah. there's nothing in this, there is nothing in this world, but specifically in sports media that you will be doing that you just get to go off and do it on your own. Somebody right. is helping you along the way and having a better understanding of how your your small universe looks in this industry, I think will make you a more well-rounded individual. You will appreciate what you, the opportunities that you are being given, but also it'll open your eyes as to how the execution gets done. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things I love about Good Morning Football is the creative side of it. Um, in January, we were doing segments. I saw Pete Carroll's on a scooter. And then I was like, yeah. I'm going to be on a scooter. And because I knew that our cameras could work a certain way, I'm like, if I run the scooter, a hole in this circle in the hallway over and over again, you guys will be able to follow me. They're like, yeah, we got you. But I knew that was the answer because I talk with these guys. I visit with them after the show. I understand how the show works from a, t- I like to think I understand how it works from a top <laughs> to bottom standpoint. And yeah. so just knowing those people and not just taking them for granted, like, cause they're all here for a reason, just because you're the one that's on the show. doesn't mean that you don't, you don't have the responsibility to know how you got on the show. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Well, that's a perfect way to end the episode, Jamie. It's really been such a pleasure getting to talk to you and getting to know you more. Uh, I truly just can't thank you enough for joining me today. Thanks, Sydney. I appreciate it. Happy Women's History Month. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Snap Broncos Country. Thanks so much for tuning in. And thank you again to Jamie Erdahl for joining me. You can find her every single day on Good Morning Football, Monday through Friday, starting at 5 a.m. Mountain Time on NFL Network. So make sure to check out the show. And I will see you guys right back here on the Broncos Podcast Network and YouTube next time for another episode of the Snap.